In this lecture, we're looking at the Catholic Reformation and the changes in the evolution to what it means to be Catholic as a result of the Reformation. And it needs to be pointed out, of course, that when you talk about the Reformation, we tend to be long on Protestantism and lean on Catholicism. And that's a bit unfair. And it actually puts Protestants, frankly, at a disadvantage because they tend to treat Catholicism in the modern world as if all it is, is a regurgitation of medieval styles and practices and applications of Catholic theology. And Catholic theology, of course, has changed and adapted over the years. It's addressed new concerns. It's gone through periods of revival and renewal, as well as new controversies and crises throughout its history. In the 20th century, of course, the big move within Catholicism was Vatican II and the changes to Catholicism there, not least of which would be things like preaching in the vernacular or in the common language, the use of the vernacular as well for the liturgy, not having to reside solely in the Latin Vulgate, which no one speaks anymore. But that's the modern world. What about the post-Reformation world? Well, to begin, we have to get some vocabulary down because it's going to help us understand it. In a bygone era, just about a generation ago, in fact, and all before that, historians tended to call this phase that I'm going to be discussing in this lecture the Counter-Reformation. And that name was eventually abandoned by at least the majority of historians, though anyone who picks up a stray history book on the church's history, or even at the popular level, it is still at least relatively common to hear the phrase Counter-Reformation. Well, why did we abandon that name? Simply put, it has a bit of an edge to it, the word counter. It makes it sound as if the existence and the ongoing evolution of Catholic practice and teaching and its understanding of itself after the Reformation was only a counter movement to the Reformation itself. One of the things we talk about a lot in history is the fact that Luther and the Reformers, of course, were what we call external Reformers. They were within the church to begin with, but as a result of the Reformation, they left the church and founded Protestant denominations of all different varieties, meaning that they're external to the Catholic Church. But that doesn't deny the fact, or it shouldn't deny the fact, that there were internal Reformers who remained within the Catholic fold. In other words, Luther and Calvin and others were not the only ones who cited problems and wanted change. What distinguishes them from the internal reformers is they left, and those who were internal reformers stayed. You can actually get a bit of this tension with both Luther and Calvin. In Luther's life, there's actually a very painful experience, a painful episode, where the men who had mentored him, you might say during his college days, his old professors back at the University of Erfurt, the men who had inspired him to join the Augustinian order, when Luther sparks the Reformation and really digs in and refuses to recant or to bow the knee, these men, these very personal friends of his, eventually abandon him. And not abandon in the sense of being disloyal, rather they felt that Luther had been disloyal to them and their teachings of him during his days there in the university. Luther eventually has to resolve himself to the fact that those who were former friends or mentors could no longer be this. In Calvin's case, it was colleagues, friends, fellow students, you might say, from his days as a humanist there in France, particularly in the city of Paris. Calvin, throughout his life, is an exile. When he's down in the Swiss regions, even though his name is virtually synonymous with the French-speaking Swiss side down in Geneva, Calvin, all of his life, by his enemies in Geneva, was called that Frenchman. He was in exile. He had left all of his kith and kin, all of the people who were his closest allies by and large, not all of them, some had come with him, but he left a great deal of relationships behind. And Calvin eventually does write against what he calls the Nicodemites, a name that refers to those who he believes are true gospel believers, but who are unwilling to leave the church, he alleges at times, either for comfort or out of fear. And he repeatedly calls on them to leave, and frequently, in most cases, they do not. So the Counter-Reformation is a bad name for an experience that is probably more visceral and personal throughout the context of the early Reformation. 
What we have now come to call this is, as the title of this lecture indicates, the Catholic Reformation. The Reformation that is germane to the Catholic Church, it certainly has some negative or some interactive moments with Protestantism, as we'll see here in a moment. But it's not entirely sort of wrapped up in this anti-Protestantism that evolves to make it a, quote, counter-Reformation only. You might say that the Catholic Reformation is both places where the Catholic Church is taking care of its own house and, in terms of the Counter-Reformation, places where it is reacting positively or negatively with Protestantism. So Catholicism is both and, not a somehow rejection of this idea that things don't change in the light of Protestantism. One of the things, though, that we have to really get our arms around is both what we call conciliar movement within Catholicism during this day. And conciliar just means what evolves or what emerges from a council. What are the changes made at the official level for the Catholic Church? And then at the end of this lecture, we're going to look at the Jesuits, the personal part, the personal side of the Catholic Reformation. As you see arise this new order, the serious order of a monastic movement that is designed to usher the Catholic Church into the modern world. Well, first of all, the council side of things, the conciliar side of things. All from the very early days of the Protestant Reformation, Luther and others called repeatedly for a church council to meet and to rule officially on things like the doctrine of justification. And we shouldn't be cynical about this. In the early days, Luther believed, at least at some level, certainly up until his trial at the Diet of Worms, that things could be restored. That though he was being accused of things and being harassed and harangued and attacked by all manner of different Catholics, that in the end, a council could solve the problem if you got enough of the best minds together to weigh in on the issues. The problem, though, is that the church had just emerged, just prior to the Reformation, frankly, from what we know as the Great Papal Schism, the moment in the Middle Ages, particularly in the 14th century, where you have not one, not two, but at times, three popes claiming to be the head of the church. And emerging out of that schism, there was a movement that we call Big C Conciliarism, which is a short-lived view within the Catholic Church, that a council is above a pope that if a council comes together, they can kind of keep the house in order, and that the Pope can more or less answer to the collective body, you might say, of a council. Now, that idea is rejected. You have to know this. Sometimes Protestants scratch their head. Who's really in charge here, a council or the Pope? Well, in the official teachings of the Catholic Church, it's more of a collaborative unison, but no one will say that a council is above a Pope. There are all kinds of councils that meet and make decisions, and the Pope eventually may not ratify these things. And so that was just a meeting of people that really didn't decide anything. Keep that in mind, by the way, whenever you see joint declarations between Protestants and Catholics. There was a famous couple of moments like evangelicals and Catholics together during the end of the 20th century, where you have Catholic cardinals of all things and other Catholic theologians meeting with Protestants. And they issue declarations about what they believe. And a lot of people lost their mind or applauded vociferously that this was some great move. Well, the problem is, is the men, the Catholics sitting on that council or on that meeting, and there are lots of others besides ECT, have no right to decide what the Catholic teaching is or is not. Rather, when you come to a council, a council is supposed to come together, make some formal declarations, and the Pope, if he ratifies it, therefore blesses the council and that is why, in official Catholic teachings, a council's decisions sometimes appear to have the same weight as papal proclamation. When that is the case, as in the case of, say, Vatican II or Vatican I or any of the councils, official Catholic teaching is that it's because the Pope has also ratified and approved of the decisions made there. Well, coming out of conciliarism, with all these calls for a council in the early days of the Reformation, the Pope was not about to allow a council to meet to decide this very thorny and knotty problem of the issues of salvation, mainly, though, for fear that this would again open the door to conciliarism. So the Pope dug in. He refused. However, in 1545, finally, again, just a year before Luther dies, 
There convened the first session of what we know today as the Council of Trent. Now, the Council of Trent is officially on the books said to have met from 1545 to 1563. This is a bit overstated. Got to be careful here. The council met in three successive stages, at times only for a matter of months or a year, sometimes for a few years. And for various reasons, the council has to, you might say, be called off. And from that, only the decisions made at, say, phase one are issued at that time, and then a successive phase will meet, etc. Well, there are three phases within the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563. And we'll go through these in order and just talk about the general tone and some of the things that are being decided here. The first two phases, just to kind of give you a grid, are more germane to the issues and the controversies of Protestantism. In this sense, that old word of the Counter-Reformation is more in effect. These are, at times, attempts by some to be conciliatory to Protestantism, particularly to Lutheranism, though in the end, on almost every point, they reject the Protestant message. The first phase meets from 1545 to 1547. This council was really leveraged by Charles V himself, that long-lived emperor from the Holy Roman Empire who seems to be everywhere in the Reformation and affecting all kinds of things. In this case, he actually, you might say demands, though he probably wouldn't have said he demanded, but he really urged the Pope to finally call a council and put things to right. Well, this council meets again, just from 1545 to 1547, and the decisions made here are mostly doctrinal. The three main ones they cover, and it's more complex than this, of course, in the course of the two years, but the three main issues that are often cited as the most important things from this phase are a decree on the doctrine of justification, a ratification about the use of the Vulgate, and the role of tradition in Catholic theology. In some of these cases, these are reaffirmations of long-standing traditions or principles within the medieval world. In the case of justification, though, which is the first one we'll talk about, this is the first, you might say, official declaration about the Catholic view of salvation. Now, that's actually quite striking, the fact that for 1,400 years, since the time of the apostles, there had not been a council to decide justification, that very core principle, sometimes strikes people as a bit strange. But it doesn't mean that everyone was just sort of willy-nilly believing whatever they want. As we saw with Luther, there was a majority opinion about the role of works in the Christian life. But no one had come together and said, okay, this is justification, and this is sanctification, and here's works, etc. A lot of it was because there had not yet been a major controversy to spark this. That, in contrast with the early church, where there were Christological controversies or Trinitarian controversies that did need to be decided pretty aggressively. Well, now that the Protestant message has arisen, now that there have been Protestant churches broken off, the Catholic Church needed to decide based on this controversy. And the language used here at the first phase of the Council of Trent is that you are justified, they say, by, quote, faith working itself out in love. Now, again, a lot of new students have come to this and they say, all right, that sounds fine. That sounds very Protestant, in fact. And I think that just goes to show the lack of real depth of clarity as to what justification is. The key words here are work and love. You see, because in the medieval tradition, works of love were, you might say, synonymous with works of penance for the sake of accruing merit. It would probably be anachronistic or overly simplistic to say that what the Catholic Church is affirming here is that it's faith and works that saves you. But it should also be pointed out that Luther never actually says that anyone in the Catholic Church teaches faith plus works full stop. That's actually not the Catholic teaching. Rather, what Luther argues is that the Catholic teachings amount to faith and works combined. And you really see this complexity here on display with this doctrine here of justified by faith working in love. Coming out of the more Augustinian tradition, there had been a long-standing belief, rightly so, that the object of your love draws you towards it and changes you to be more like it. And Augustine and his followers in the Middle Ages always knew that when God is our supreme love, when we are drawn towards him, that relational drawing changes us to be more like him, of course. The problem, though, again, for Luther and for the Reformers is that from the High Middle Ages on, and particularly in the Latter Middle Ages, 
This idea of being drawn towards in this change, this renovation of who we are in relationship to God, had developed into, again, a very concrete, transactional view of merit. There was all this talk about what you need to do to pay back the debt of your sin. In some ways, it's at least analogically the same, or at least in parallel somewhat, to the original Augustinian position. But it had developed and deepened so much, and it had come to rest so much on the conversation of merit in the Christian life and penance, that in the end, Luther will say, this really does amount to justification by faith and works. Not justification by works, that's full Pelagianism. The church had already rejected that. What Luther is saying is, through some sneaky backdoor way, and Luther says this about everybody, we always end up saying, I get in by faith, but I have to stay in by works. If anything, that's what Luther is more concerned about. No one is going to be so bold as to say, well, what we're going to believe is that we have to earn our salvation. No one says that. Rather, they start with faith, they start with God's grace, and then they say, but, that but is the important one. But works of love have to follow. So in a manner of speaking, the Council of Trent here is very strong against the Lutheran and the Protestant understanding of salvation by faith. You might say that the Catholic Church embraces salvation by faith, but the key word that they will reject is by faith alone. Again, though, Protestants believe that there are works of love that are part and parcel to the Christian life. They've read the book of James, let's put it that way. They know exactly what is required of the Christian life in terms of the change that God is going to work in us. The important thing here, though, is they reject the idea that we are justified by that. They will say, no, we are justified by Christ's work only. Any change, any renovation in our heart is a result of the Spirit's activity in us once we are children of the King. It is not something that can be revoked where we get, you might say, removed from the family of God. Sin and stumbling and all these things are disciplines that God gives to us as children, but they are not the ground of our justification. Rather, they are part of the Christian life thereafter. So that's one. Secondly, this phase talks about the Vulgate. And it, again, reaffirms this idea that the Vulgate, which is the 5th century translation of the Bible into Latin by St. Jerome. Well, the Vulgate in Jerome's day was just fine. A lot of people spoke Latin. It would not be unlike a new, let's say, English translation of the Bible today in a manner of speaking. And a lot of people scratch their head about this. Why would the church say that the Vulgate is the only text? Is this some sort of KJV-only type of opinion from the Catholic Church? The answer is no. The proclamation here is not that only Christians can read the Vulgate per se. The reality is, is the Catholic Church has always had vernacular translations. They still do today. Even those who are very pro-Vulgate still use vernacular translations to help them understand it. Rather, what the proclamation here entails is that the only official text that can be argued over, let's say doctrinally, in the context of a council maybe, is the Vulgate itself. They, of course, know that the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew. They knew the complexity of interpretation. But in many ways, this doubling down on the Vulgate is a signal of how much they appreciate the complexity of interpretation. What they're saying here is basically, don't bring in a bunch of new, maybe Protestant translations of the scriptures, which have, we might say, theological axes to grind. You see, they had read the Protestant translations of the Bible. They knew that at the translational level, there were all kinds of words and choices and reapplications of verses, subtly so, but ones that could confuse. Take, for example, the Tyndale Bible. When he got to the word ekklesia in the Greek, he did not translate that word to mean the church. So any place Paul, let's say, is referring to the church or the ekklesia, Tyndale very famously always translated that word, or nearly always, to be congregation. The Catholic Church knows this. They know of other places at other fights like this where Protestants are choosing alternative translational words, you might say, in order to express what they believe the scriptures are teaching. In the case of Tyndale, he doesn't want anyone to confuse that what Paul is talking about is the Catholic Church, so he uses the word congregation. So when the Council of Trent decides that they're going to only use the Vulgate, what they mean there is it's going to be the only official text. They're not going to say it's inspired. 
they don't really go there. They don't believe that Jerome's Latin translation is somehow descended from on high. Rather, what they're saying is, we will control the interpretation and we're going to control it at the level of what text we're going to use whenever we have a debate. Lastly, tradition. Tradition is one of those issues that often gets a Protestant world in a bit of hot water. Protestants in the modern world, particularly after the Great Awakening movements have made us more, let's say, revivalistic, have tended to believe that Protestants don't believe in tradition at all. The unfortunate fact is that is entirely false. It's that line of thinking that gets evangelicals in particular into trouble when they start saying things like, well, we don't have any creeds or confessions. We, we just have the Bible. We don't have any tradition. We don't follow any tradition at all, no matter what denomination we happen to be a part of. Typically, when people say that, what they're missing is the fact that they have a tradition. They're just assuming that they don't have a tradition. The better way to look at this is the Catholic understanding of tradition, you might say, is tradition with a capital T, whereas Protestants affirm tradition with a lowercase t. Now, this is just my way of explaining the difference. In the Protestant tradition, they believe in tradition. Protestants, by and large, with a couple of exceptions in the Reformation in the 16th century, embraced traditional elements of, say, the liturgical year. They kept Easter. They didn't throw that out. They kept Christmas. They kept all kinds of things. Maybe they pared it down from the Middle Ages, but they didn't throw out the calendar. They also knew, and Calvin talks about this and Luther talks about this, that there are all kinds of things that have arisen in the context of the church's history that are to be embraced, not on the level of the Bible, but as good and necessary consequences of the role of the church's history. The creeds are a great example. Every single Protestant believes that the ancient creeds are a normative grammar for how we're going to describe God in the person of Jesus Christ. We're not going to be Arian. We're not going to be Gnostic. We're going to reject these alternative views of how to read the scriptures. None of them would say that the creeds are part of that Catholic tradition, big T thing, and therefore we're going to throw them out. Rather, for Protestants, they have a tradition they just, you might say, hold it lightly. They're always willing to spot abuses in the use of tradition and work against that either through reform or at times through rejecting things that had been good, but because of idolatry had become or will become, this is an ongoing reality in Protestant life, things that we need to be more careful with. In the Catholic Church, stemming from this first phase of the Council of Trent, tradition with a big T means more that when you have a tradition that arises within the church, and if that tradition is embraced or affirmed at the council and then at the papal level, that these become, they wouldn't say equal with scripture, but they become an equal guide and an equal grounding on the practice of the Christian life. So take the liturgical year again. As I said, Protestants are not all that opposed to it. They're opposed to some of it. If it becomes sort of this idolatrous imposition of historical practices that are seen to be the only way all Christians ought to live, period. Protestants will reject that, but they'll be okay with others. Just see the debates that go on even today about, for example, Lent. The question of, well, that's some human history, etc. That's a Protestant fight. In the Catholic Church, if Lent has arisen, let's say, or other parts of the Christian calendar, or other parts of doctrine or expression, maybe the doctrines of Mary, or of the Rosary, or of other practices that are very germane to the Catholic Church, if these have become embraced and then accepted at all levels, then they become, Protestants would say, equal with Scripture. But the Catholic understanding of it is these are the authoritative interpretations of how we ought to live. Again, the Catholic move here is to say the interpretation of the Bible is a challenge, and therefore, to stand tall only on the Bible means that you're avoiding some of the good and necessary interpretive challenges that only the church can decide for you. So that's phase one, 1545 to 1547. The second phase is much shorter. It's 1551 to 1552. At this council, and you'll remember from a previous lecture, this is about the time when we're going to have the Treaty of Passau and the Peace of Augsburg. This is a time when there is at least some move to try to bring a certain balance between Lutheran and Catholic perspectives on things. And for that reason, here at this second council, there were a number of Lutheran visitors there to come as witnesses, you might say, or at least non-vocal participants during this council. One is the man Chemnitz, one of the more important later Lutheran developers 
of Lutheran theology. He's there. He eventually writes a commentary on this Council of Trent. Here at the Council of Trent, again, because they're engaging with Lutheranism, the main issue, not the only issue, but the main issue on the table was the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, you'll recall, of course, that the Lutheran faith believes in a physical eating, a physical presence of Christ. The question here is, can you believe merely in a physical presence of Christ, or must you affirm the doctrine of transubstantiation in the Catholic sense? Now, to be clear, Luther just simply believes that it is a mystery and that Christ is present physically. The Catholic understanding of transubstantiation is a bit more of an application or an understanding as to how Christ is present. The way to understand this, the simplest way, frankly, is we're very used to the word transform. Transformation is, just underline that word, form. The form is the thing you see. So if I were to transform, I would change into the man that I am, into some other shape. Some external form to who I am would change. Catholic doctrine on the Lord's Supper does not believe that there is a transformation of the elements. If it were a transformation, well, the wafer would turn into bits of flesh, and the wine would turn literally, visibly, and even, you might say, olfactory, the smell and the taste and everything, would transform into blood. They don't believe that. The word is transubstance, the transubstantiation. Underlie the word substance. The substance of something is the core identity of it. So the form of who I am, or what something is, can change. But the old Aristotelian way of looking at this is that the substance of something may not change. Take the case of me. If I were to lose an arm, my form, the thing you see about me, would be radically different. I'd be a one-armed man. But none of us would say that by having changed that form, that the substance, the essence of who I am was a different thing. I'd still be myself. The doctrine of transubstantiation in the Catholic Church, in other words, says, you don't see it, you don't taste it, but the essence of the bread and wine become the body and blood physically. That's the core doctrine. Well, at this council in phase two, they reject the idea that you can simply affirm physical eating according to mystery, and that to be Catholic, to truly believe in the Mass, you have to affirm the doctrine of transubstantiation. So, in terms of any reconciliation on any level with Lutheranism, this second phase comes to no avail. Lastly and thirdly, the third phase of the Council of Trent from 1562 to 1563 is where you see some changes begin to happen, where the Catholic Church is beginning to put its house in order according to its own terms, now that it has come to the conclusion that there will be no reconciliation with Protestantism at any point. At this council, the doctrine of purgatory is reaffirmed. Notice it's not affirmed for the first time, but it's reaffirmed. And after that, there are a number of moral reforms and educational reforms that are put on the books that the Catholic Church hopes will usher the church into a new modern world, that it will correct some of the abuses that were there from the Middle Ages, and it will issue in some new things, some renewed things even, to really sort of galvanize what it means to be Catholic. There are regulations, for example, about what can be called a relic. There are all kinds of fake relics going about being touted as a piece of the true cross or a thorn from the crown of thorns and all these kinds of things. And it was getting a bit ridiculous. There was no regulations on this. Well, this council puts regulations on it. There were regulations about indulgences. They were no longer to be sold, for example. How bishops were to be selected to their offices and how they were supposed to remain in their diocese and be good shepherds of the pastors there. There was also a call educationally for seminaries and schools and training centers to be funded all throughout the world as they knew it. And by this point, of course, the new world is becoming increasingly a real focus for much of Europe. Now, in terms of the context of Europe, this call for a renewed sense of education and a new commitment to it was relatively underdeveloped. There simply weren't the funds to really bolster this. However, if you cast your eye just across the American university landscape, even today, notice the significant number of Catholic universities or universities that maybe were devoutly Catholic to begin with, strictly Catholic that are more now broad, highly respected institutions where students are Catholic or not Catholic or sometimes of no religion at all. St. John's, Notre Dame, Gonzaga, Loyola, Catholic University in Washington, D.C. These are just a few. 
If you look at the real robust educational focus of, in particular, American Catholicism, you'll see some of the collateral impact of this call from the Council of Trent. The long history of American Catholic education really stems from this call to not let Protestantism be the only educational muscle throughout the known world. So that's the Council of Trent. Now, one last word before we move on to the Jesuits. To this day, we sometimes refer to something that we call Tridentine Catholicism. And Tridentine Catholicism is a word that describes Catholicism from this point, the Council of Trent, frankly, all the way down until the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council is so important a shift in the way Catholicism views itself that everything after that is really, you might say, more Vatican than it is Tridentine. Well, what do we mean? Well, the word Tridentine in Latin is just the word for Trent, the city where the Council of Trent met. So when we say Tridentine Catholicism, that kind of robust Latin, Vulgate, traditional Catholicism that is known throughout the centuries, what we mean is the Catholicism that is formed and reformed and shaped here at the Council of Trent. Okay, that's the conciliar side. What about the personal side? Well, there arose, shortly after the Reformation, the Jesuits. You really cannot underappreciate or speak too hyperbolically about the role of the Jesuits over the centuries. You can, so you've got to be careful here. There were other monastic traditions and other movements that are vital for the modern Catholic movement, but the Jesuits are really at the forefront. There are some that might equal the Jesuits, but none surpass them. How do the Jesuits come about? Well, they come about from Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius of Loyola was from a Basque family, which is up in the northern part of Spain, and he had been a soldier. In 1521, though, he was wounded. He had a badly shattered leg after a battle. And, and you can imagine, no painkillers, not really much of a plaster cast, no opportunity for surgery. You were really an invalid in bed waiting for a leg to heal, particularly once it shatters. Well, notice the date as well, 1521. This is well after Luther has really kind of made his stand. Well, Ignatius, there, residing at Manresa, up in the northern part of Spain, begins to turn his attention to prayer. The opportunity for becoming a soldier or remaining a soldier after a shattered leg was rather dim, so he turns to his faith. And Ignatius develops one of the more important articulations of the role of prayer or the practice of prayer that is read all the way until today, even by Protestants. He might call it mindful meditation or mindful prayer. This idea that you may be, for example, in the Stations of the Cross during the Easter season or the Lent season, the way you meditate actively on something, not just simply waiting on a spiritual impulse first. That really becomes a hallmark of the Jesuit spirituality. Well, he starts to take on followers from this. People hear and begin to understand that this man, Ignatius, is a man to follow. Around 1534, he has gathered around him men like Xavier, another famous name that will eventually become a university, and a number of others, about five more in 1534. And it grows from there. Now, this is just a small group of lay Christians. However, within a number of years, they take on monastic vows, and they form a Jesuit order. In 1540, in fact, Pope Paul III accepts the Jesuit order as the newest, you might say, branch of monasticism. And you'll note, of course, there's Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, etc. It's important to note, by the way, that all of these other orders in the monastic world usually had to wait a great deal of time before they would be accepted. To be accepted in 1540 is incredibly fast. And it does speak a bit to the need for some real devout, I might say aggressive forms of monastic life to really offset the Protestant message. In 1548, a number of years later, the spiritual exercises as the book that encapsulates Ignatius' understanding of prayer would later be called, is accepted as official Catholic teaching, as one of the best books to understand Catholic prayer. And to this day, again, the spiritual exercises are still in print and read widely. Well, who were the Jesuits? Well, put simply, the Jesuits become, as one Catholic scholar called them, the shock troops of the new Catholic understanding of itself, particularly over against Protestantism. They do all kinds of radical things. They are radical missionaries, for example. They go all throughout 
South America. They go as far out as China, all over the place. They are at the Pope's beck and call, and they will go high and low at his command. They were not going to be lazy and boring or committed to building houses and taking endowments. They were on the move. The other thing about the Jesuits, though, is again, from an educational standpoint, they become significantly important for the modern educational resurgence in Catholic theology. Some of the most important anti-Protestant books and some of the most important purely Catholic teachings on things, often over the centuries, are written by Jesuits. A lot of those Catholic universities that I mentioned often would be Jesuit-founded or would have an overwhelming population of Jesuit scholars in their midst as the faculty. The Jesuits, in other words, take on both the Catholic and, as we said before, the counter motifs here in the Reformation within the Catholic Church. They are both those who are committed zealously to making Catholics better at being Catholic. But when push comes to shove, and depending on who we're talking about over the years, there are plenty of Jesuits who will take up their arms, metaphorically maybe with a pen or at times, literally take up arms to go after the Protestant faith. Now, they are met by Protestant people carrying arms just as well. They're not the aggressors in every case. But there are plenty of cases, both good and bad, of how the Jesuit order in many ways, personally, embodies a new, robust, committed idea of what it means to be Roman Catholic. Thank you.